So I want to go look up what's the flow rate over Niagara Falls because I need to figure that out to figure out how hard it would be to fit into a straw. And I learned the flow rate is set by an international treaty. Both countries have an incentive to like divert water for the use in hydropower. So the US and Canada have a treaty saying that like this is the minimum flow rate over Niagara Falls and no country can withdraw more water than uh, uh, you know, required to keep it at that flow rate. And so the next question I had was like, well, wait a minute, this, this line in this treaty mentioned that it's enforced by officers appointed by the US and Canada. And so like somewhere out there, there are two people who are, in, who are like authorized to enforce this international treaty. In my head, I imagine this being a Mulder and Scully, like X-Files type team. It's like if water goes missing from Niagara Falls, they're authorized to like travel around the world and use any means necessary to get it back. Eventually, I had a friend uh, at Harvard Law School contact the like joint commission and be like, hey, who are the current commissioners, like the current uh, designees under the treaty? And they sent over their names and a little slideshow about their jobs. <laughs> I don't know if it is valuable, it probably is. I think it's just like a, a fact of, of life. People are curious about things. Um, you know, I feel like whether or not people know a lot about some particular science topic, like everyone kind of wonders about stuff. And what's really cool about science is that it gives you like tools to answer some of these questions that might otherwise like be unanswerable. Um, but I don't think you need to encourage people to be curious so much as just like encourage, like let them know that, hey, there are some ways to answer these questions. You know, you don't have to teach a little kid to be interested in like what would happen if the moon crashed into the earth. Like kids come that way. Like we're all kind of curious about that, uh, I think. Um, but what's, what's neat is realizing that like it's not like it's, uh, it's not a silly question to ask or, you know, even if it is a silly question, it's it's still a question, you know, it has answers. You can, uh, you can figure them out. And sometimes that turns out to be helpful and sometimes it doesn't, uh, but either way, I think it's cool and interesting. I've written uh, What If Too, which is a book of answers to questions that readers submitted to me where I did a bunch of research and tried to figure out what the answers would be and wrote them up. My favorite thing about questions, uh, answering people's questions like this, is that when I read the question, I often don't know what the answer is. You know, I'll be like, well, of course, you know, the, the aircraft carrier wouldn't get sucked down into that kind of whirlpool. It would probably just, you know, float around it in circles. Uh, it's too big. At least I think it's too big. Well, wait, what's the biggest whirlpool? Um, okay, well, how long are these aircraft carriers? And then I'll get like, suddenly find myself going down these rabbit holes of research where I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, the main part of the hull of an aircraft carrier, how strong is it? What's it made of? And then I find out you can't just Google blueprints of all our aircraft carriers because apparently that stuff is classified. And so the next thing I know, I'm on some weird corner of the internet, like finding like, you know, Bob the aircraft carrier enthusiasts, like unauthorized blueprints of aircraft carriers and trying to, just to try to figure out like how the, you know, hull is laid out or some, some sort of minor question so that I can go back to answer the main question that someone asked in the first place. Um, but sometimes the really small, uh, like uh, intermediate questions that come up in the process of researching a question turn out to be like the hardest and most interesting. Mm -hmm.